Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Foltz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana, she's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. a Michigan lumber baron decided to move south to Louisiana seeking to enhance his fortune. It was the height of Reconstruction and soon William Ramsey owned two sawmills on the Calcasieu River that employed more citizens and paid out more wages than any other farm in the town of Lake Charles. As part of his legacy, he built a majestic Queen Anne mansion that today stands in the heart of one of the most historical and architecturally significant neighborhoods in America. I'm Chef John Falls. Welcome to the Chupentier District of Lake Charles and to the Ramsey Curtis Mansion. This elegant B&B is a mixture of revival renaissance, southern colonial and Georgian style. Purchased by Judy and Michael Curtis in 1989, the mansion boasts a Juliet balcony with intricate and charming features. These double French doors off the foyer lead into the parlor with its 11-foot ceilings. The corner fireplace, complete with mirrored mantel, is conveniently positioned and decorated with wooden tile, all acquired from the Ramsey Lumber Company. The alcove of Curly Cypress served as the minister's place for weddings and funerals. Look at this gorgeous stand here. And y'all, what a beauty here. This mid-1800s pump organ is in perfect working condition, and if your legs are up to it, Michael and Judy welcome their guests to sit and serenade them for a while. Built in the heyday of the lumber industry, this home was an unofficial landmark in Lake Charles. William Ramsey moved here from Michigan in the late 19th century, seeking his fortune in lumber. It seems only fitting that a home adorned with rich panel ceilings crafted of oak and curly cypress and beautiful gingerbread doorways is occupied today by descendants of that same industry. This cozy little cupola is a sitting room off the master suite and overlooks the hand-carved staircase. The honeymoon suite featured in Southern Living is one of four guest rooms along with the carriage house. The queen-sized cherry four-poster bed is dressed in Battenberg lace and enhances the original Queen Anne scroll work displayed in the window seat. The Oak View Suite features an English antique bedroom complete with carved headboard and footboard, oval mirrored vanity dresser, and a washstand with antique pitcher and basin. Y'all, I want you to stop and check out this detail for a while. It's absolutely magnificent. Just look at here. This suite overlooks the fountain from the balcony and showcases unique, beautiful mahogany inlaid pieces, including a dresser and washstand, hence its name, the Fountain View Room. Y'all, when you awaken from that long, restful sleep, enjoy a southern breakfast in the dining room, worn by a fireplace crafted of mahogany with iron facing, including the Ramsey Crest. This home is overfilled with family heirlooms, furniture, and pictures. 
What a way to spend that special evening away from home. Ah, y'all, what a gorgeous home. William Ramsey came to Lake Charles, Louisiana in about 1885. He was one of the lumber barons, the people that we call the Michigan men, who came here and uh, harvested the lumber to create one of the greatest industries in the South. And he built that magnificent home. And hey, we're, we can go in and stay in his bedroom or his children's bedroom. It is one of the nicest, without a doubt, uh, homes in all of the B&Bs uh, that I've seen in Louisiana, or for that matter, around the world. The, the appointments, the decoration, and just the style of architecture, incredible. And we're going to meet a couple people who know a lot about uh, the Ramsey Curtis mansion as the uh, show goes on today. But first of all, the food, y'all. Michigan men, lumber barons, lumber companies. Well, of course, hey, you're talking about hearty appetites, right? And needless to say, when you talk about hearty appetites, meatloaf is one of the things that you would find uh, on the table. Now, don't touch that clicker because I said meatloaf. Don't touch it. Meatloaf is one of the best dishes in the world. Country fare, comfort food, y'all. And it has to be made with a lot of good flavor, so the sauce is as important as the meat itself. So take a look at my bowl here. I have a nice ground chuck. This is about a, oh, maybe about a 15% fat, so that means that it's uh, quite lean. And uh, remember, Americans eat about 70 pounds a year, y'all. 70 pounds, if you can imagine that of ground beef every year. So you know it's popular, so why not try to create great dishes with it? Into the uh, two pounds or so of ground beef, I'm putting one egg and about a quarter cup of milk to help hold this meatloaf together. Now I'm gonna put in a little onion, season this thing. So often I find that people making a meatloaf will just throw an egg in, a little breadcrumbs, a little salt and pepper, and what do you have? You just have basic, uh, hamburger that you can throw out on a grill, which is fine, but this needs to stand alone. No lettuce and tomatoes here, y'all. It needs uh, to really be bulked up a little bit. Uh, garlic, a lot of nice garlic in, in a meatloaf, so throw a couple good pieces down in there. Now for the seasoning. Obviously some good Creole seasoning. Throw it down in here. A little bit salt, pepper, herbs, spices, y'all. Put a little, uh, a little basil in here, a little uh, uh, oregano. I love oregano in this as well. Thyme, naturally. These flavors won't combat each other in a meatloaf. They'll just blend really nice and marry well. Now you have to get your hands amongst this thing. You have to, this is a finger food to create a good meatloaf, y'all. So I've washed my hands, yep, twice, two, three times, actually. Now down into the meat and you just crush it like this. Don't think for a minute that there's anything wrong with using your hands when you, uh, when you mix uh, food. Just make sure, obviously, that you wash them well, and nobody wants to eat after you put dirty hands in something, right? So go ahead and mix this up nicely here. Breadcrumbs, y'all, will hold it all together, and I'm using the seasoned Italian breadcrumbs. You could use fresh and uh, flavor them yourself with more basil and thyme, but I'm using seasoned Italian breadcrumbs and that'll help bind all of this meatloaf together. And then you can form it into a loaf. And I really rather put it into a, a pan that, that doesn't have high sides on it because then the meatloaf doesn't cook uh, thoroughly. So I'm gonna put it in this little pan right next to my mixing bowl here and form it kind of country style, y'all. Don't, uh, don't think that this is a pate or, or a terrine. This is a country flavored uh, dish. This is a country looking dish. So go ahead and pat it just like that. What a fantastic looking piece of meat and a hearty meal for tonight. Now, one of the things that you want to remember a lot of people are afraid of ground beef. They're afraid of oysters. They're afraid of fat. I don't know. They're afraid of everything in the kitchen today. Well, you have to cook ground beef about 150 degrees, make sure it's well cooked, and then you won't have any trouble with any of the things you're afraid of in uh, ground beef. Get it cooked 150 degrees and you're perfect. Now, let's go ahead and make the sauce here, y'all. I'm going to make a really nice fresh tomato sauce, so I'm going to begin with a little olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, not any of that fake stuff or second press. I'm going for the first press here. And just put a little bit of it in the pan. And now I have to flavor it with, of course, garlic. And you see that I'm taking the garlic and I'm actually uh, putting slivered garlic in here and just cooking it for a second, if you can see that, just to brown the edges of that garlic nicely 
just to add the garlic flavor to the dish. Now, once it starts to toast, I want to quit that cooking process. Look at that, y'all. Woo! That's hot. I told you this was a hot dish. Now, you want to go ahead and let that olive oil and garlic coat these fresh Roma tomatoes. This is really nice, really nice Roma tomatoes in here. Let this saute quickly. Add a little chicken stock to it. Just a little touch, just to kind of bring the moisture out. Not too much. You want the fresh tomatoes to kind of cook. Look how pretty that is, y'all. Just take a look at that, how nice that is. Throw into it some fresh basil. I like to just chop my basil right down into it like this. And uh, just let it simmer. Let it simmer. Let the tomato break down. And this is going to cook quickly, too, y'all. 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. The flavor is going to be really nice. Go ahead and add a little salt. Put in a little oregano, a little bit more chopped thyme into the dish. And look how nice and fresh that looks, y'all. See how pretty that is? Just a beautiful dish. And this becomes the sauce for our meatloaf. Now, of course, I have some already done here in my little pitcher. So I'm going to pour it right over the top of the meatloaf like this. And then I'm going to go into a 375 degree oven for about an hour. You want to cook it, as I said, 150 degrees, y'all. And take a look at what that meatloaf looks like when it's all said and done. Just a beautiful main entree for the table. Isn't that gorgeous? And look at that fresh tomato sauce all around the bottom of the meatloaf. It just show, it's almost like a picture frame around that meat, y'all, and so full of flavor as well. Now, the next dish I want to do for you complements that meatloaf. It kind of helps you along with a, a, a bread dish, something simple that can be cooked very quickly, and it's called skillet, skillet cornbread. And I have all of the ingredients to flavor that cornbread right on the uh, board right here. Take a look at all of the different things that's going to go in here. Bacon powder, a little salt, egg, milk, cream-style corn, y'all, cornbread, of course. Put some fresh corn in there or cream-style corn, bacon fat. Don't be afraid of food, y'all. Moderation in everything, including moderation. A little bit bacon, onion, celery, all of those kind of things. So look at here in this bowl. I have about a half a cup of flour and about a cup of good cornmeal, y'all. So I'm going to kind of mix that around a little bit. And then into that, one egg. Just throw it in. I'm making a cornbread batter here. And just think of all of the uh, great cornbread, uh, cornmeal breads out there, hush puppies. Oh, my God, all, all over the South, y'all, good hush puppies. Uh, corn fritters, needless to say. Corn bread, really nice. Stir that around a little bit. You see how dry it is? Don't panic here because the cream-style corn that I'm going to add to it, the uh, bacon fat that I'm going to put in, a little bit butter. When I first made this recipe, I got a little bit afraid of how dry it was, and I decided to go ahead and add a little bit more milk to it and it came out a little bit runny. So now I've learned that whenever I make this dish, I want to make sure that I allow for the bacon fat and the cream style corn. I put red bell peppers, a little bit onions, jalapenos, y'all, because this is a spicy cornbread, and a little sugar, just like that. Now just go ahead and blend it together, blend it in, mix it until all of those good flavors come together, and it won't take long. And then this is going to go, this skillet cornbread is going to cook for about 25 minutes or so in a 375 degree oven. Now let me show you what I have on the stove over here. I already have my skillet nice and hot. And I'm going to put a little touch of butter in the bottom of that hot skillet because this is going to crust the bottom of that cornbread. So look at here, y'all, right down into that hot skillet. See that sizzle? Well, it's like a fritter. It's like a good hush puppy that you would eat with, uh, what, fried, uh, fried fish, fried seafood. Just kind of mash it around in there like this. It's going to blend nicely, and as it cooks, of course, it's going to spread out. And then, y'all, once it's nice and smooth and crusted on the bottom, then you can go into your oven. As I said, about 375 degrees or so for about 20 minutes. I have some in here already nice and brown. Ah, look at here, look at here. And you can either serve it right in the skillet. I like to serve it right in the skillet. Let me put this down right on the counter. Let me make a little room here for you. Put this right on the counter, and I'm going to garnish it just a little bit, y'all, with some carrot, 
right around the top. You can put some more corn right on top. Take a good wedge out of it and pile it up on the table nicely, and you're going to have a beautiful accompanying dish to your meatloaf. Just a really fabulous, simple dish. The meatloaf is simple, the cornbread is simple, but together they really make a nice hearty meal for a lumberjack or just somebody sitting at home wanting a nice, uh, a, a nice dinner. Really simple country fare, comfort food, I call it, y'all. Now, there's a preservationist in the city of Lake Charles who really, really has a passion for his city. And he was good enough to get a horse, get a carriage. And uh, he and I took a ride around that Sharp and Kid district, that Carpenter's district, and he pointed out some of the more unique features of one of the most interesting towns in all of the South and a bed and breakfast community at its best. Let's visit with Adley Cormier and take a roll all around the streets of Lake Charles. Adley, we just enjoyed a fantastic carriage ride through Lake Charles, and thanks for setting that up uh, uh, for me, through a magnificent district called the uh, Charpentier District. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, the Charpentier District is a 28-block area of historic homes in uh, Lake Charles. Uh, the name Charpentier comes from the French carpenters who built most of the houses that you see in the Charpentier district. Now, you know, I would have never thought of Lake Charles as being a Victorian wonderland, but that's exactly what it is. It really is, John. Uh, the housing styles in Lake Charles include a gamut of Victorian styles from the Painted Ladies through East Lake and a Colonial Revival. It's really a primer of Victorian architecture. Uh, one of the distinctive things in Lake Charles uh, homes specifically are the towers. A great variety of houses have towers and it's quite uh, bewildering in some cases. And there's a great variety of woods, not only the uh, curly cypress and the longleaf pine that are worldwide known uh, from southwest Louisiana, but also sassafras and gum that are used on the insides of houses. And uh, there is a great variety like there is here at the uh, Curtis Ramsey house. Now, it's one of the first things you notice as you walk in is this great, great use of, uh, of different textured uh, uh, woods. Now, it seems that after the Civil War, there was a, a, a tremendous lumber boom here. Why was that? Well, there was a great need uh, nationwide for lumber, of course, and uh, uh, many people came to southwest Louisiana, which was the unexplored corner of Louisiana. Like, southwest Louisiana wasn't part of the plantation economy. And this was new territory, uh, new uh, forest to be uh, exploited, a new industry to be built. And uh, there were people from all over the, the world that came here, Germans and Americans, and uh, they developed this industry. Now, you know, I was reading something the other day that in 1880, there was an invasion of the Michigan men. <laughs> Why did they come to Lake Charles? Well, the Michigan men came to Lake Charles expressly to help develop this, this lumbering industry. Uh, in 1880, the railroad finally came through Lake Charles, and uh, with them came these Michigan men who had developed lumbering in Michigan and who, in many cases, were carpetbaggers and had <laughs> seen this lumbering uh, uh, potential in southwest Louisiana and returned to exploit it. So uh, uh, because of the railroad primarily, but because of other needs, these Michigan men uh, developed mills up and down the Calcasieu River and uh, this is one of the homes of one of those original Michigan men. Ah, yeah, absolutely fantastic house, too. Now, Lake Charles is actually an architectural style in itself. Exactly right. There are uh, the French carpenters that built these houses sort of mixed and matched plans. And they developed a style that is uniquely Lake Charles. Uh, one of the prime examples of that is the Lake Charles Column, a two-story square paneled column that is called the Lake Charles Column, whether you see it in a house in Lake Charles or in Utah. <laughs> so uh, that, along with odd numbers of, of uh, columns in the front of a home, unusual window treatments, these are all distinctive parts of that Lake Charles style. Now, you know, you pointed out to me as we were riding through the district in the uh, carriage, you said, John, that's a nice little house for sale. A little bargain. Yes, <laughs> Maybe you could take me around a little private tour here just to point out some of those that I'd, I'd like to have you one of well, these. Well, you may want homes. to move. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Thanks so much for sharing all of this great information with us today, and I appreciate the tour, too. Thanks, John.
Y'all, I think the day might come when I may very well buy one of those Victorian mansions, one of the painted ladies of Lake Charles. They're absolutely gorgeous. And you saw the carriage ride? Just think about uh, Christmas Eve, the holiday season. Uh, what about a nice cup of mole apple cider as you're uh, taking a ride through town? I've made some right here, and I'm going to serve you up a, a little cup of it. And this is a, a gallon or so of nice apple cider, and then a little bit sugar, a little bit, I have a cup of sugar, allspice, mace, clove, coriander, all those nice flavors, and then a little cinnamon stick, orange, and a little lemon. This is an absolutely beautiful apple cider for a cold night in Lake Charles. And another great recipe that Judy shared with me, her mom's bread. Y'all take a look at this beautiful holiday bread made with six cups of bread flour, uh, uh, about a half an ounce of yeast, and she even adds one and a half teaspoons of baking powder, and that's what really makes this bread nice and light. Now, y'all, another great dish that I discovered there, of all the dishes I found at the B&B, is one of the more interesting, and certainly one that I've used a lot, is her Michigan man, man's Dutch apple pancake. It's like a souffle coming right out of the skillet. It took a while, but she finally allowed me into the kitchen to share her secret of uh, the secrets of that great recipe. And now, guess what? You're the lucky one because you get to watch us do it. Try it. It's fabulous. Judy, last time I was here visiting this fantastic house of yours, you introduced me to something that uh, may have been a souffle. It may have been a pancake. It could have been, um, well, I don't know, it could have been an omelet. <laughs> what exactly was it? You call it a, a Dutch apple pancake. Where did that recipe come that, from? That was an old family recipe from an old family cookbook that we got. And actually, it just called for jam. So you could just spread so a could, little bit of jam. Yeah. It's so simple. And you know another thing? You had such a variety of great family pieces. I mean, uh, postcards and obviously a lot of recipes. That's great when you see those things saved in a home. And one of the reasons we're using the apples is because Michigan was famous for their apples, and that's a, a big crop there. Yeah, and, and, and in Louisiana, we could actually use strawberries or yes, something else, anything, in, but I think the yeah. apples are really nice because you can yes. get them all year long. See, that one wants to jump in right now. <laughs> okay, I have four eggs here, and, and I'm whipping them up real good. You want to blend them nicely, right, huh? Yes, you want those whipped up pretty good. Pretty okay, well, and then we're going to okay. Then we're going to add a half a cup of flour, but we need to add it okay. I'm just gonna put, slowly put. and to whip it really well because otherwise we're lump. going to have it. <laughs> get all those lumps in there. The so you get me the hard yes, job, right? Yes, I did, and I gave you a powder at the same time. Oh, that's okay, huh? Hey, look, in the kitchen you're supposed to make mess, right? After all, you have to clean up. That's true. <laughs> okay, yeah, you do want to whip it up real good yes, to get very that out. Well. Okay, and then once the flour's in? And then we add a half a cup of milk, oh, and okay. it can be regular milk or skim if you Want to yeah, watch you want your fat to. a little bit? Well, you know I'm not interested in that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and next? And then we add a half a teaspoon of salt. Okay, just dump that in. Of course, I guess you can leave the salt out too if you want to. You could salt. if you wanted to. Okay, good. All right, now what else goes in next? The flavorings over there. Well, the flavorings I like to use are vanilla, nutmeg, and cinnamon, and okay. I usually just do it to taste. Okay, and just I go like ahead and a, put a little bit in. I like to use about a tablespoon of um, vanilla. Vanilla, and then maybe a quarter of a teaspoon of cinnamon. There you go. And also a quarter of a teaspoon of nutmeg, but you can use. Allspice or, all spice or clothes. clothes. Yeah, I, I like all of that as well. Okay, now once it's all whipped, of course it goes into a 400 degree oven. You mm -hmm. preheat it to 400 degrees, mm -hmm. but when you put it in the oven, then you want to cut it down, right? Yeah, about to 375. Okay, and then this goes into a non-stick mm -hmm. skillet because very it's important. got to ride very important. Why don't you go yes. ahead and pour that in? Okay. And I've got one already in the oven to oh. show everybody. Let me pull that out of here. Y'all take a look at this. You've never seen anything like it. Now, how would we garnish that, Judy? Well, today we're going to use our Michigan apples. Okay, let me throw and, some uh, in. Just right in the middle, right? Yes, just okay. put them in there any way you like. And then, of course, we could also put this on a big, beautiful platter. platter okay, yes. and uh, next, a little uh, bit of this. We could use the uh, whipped cream uh, and a lot of whipped cream. A lot of whipped cream. <laughs> we could even add a, some extra things like the powdered sugar. Oh, and look. some people even like to use a little extra cinnamon or nutmeg just to, for the garnish. Oh, right. Or and we could add some of your fresh mint there that looks so good. Oh, uh, Judy, this is absolutely a beautiful thing, and I and I really mean it when I say, of all the B and B recipes I've collected. 
I really appreciate this one the most. It's really interesting and so simple to do. Thanks a oh, lot for sharing it with us. Thank you. Ah, y'all, I told you it was a beautiful pancake souffléed right out of that skillet. And you know what Judy keeps telling me? A non-stick skillet. It has to be non-stick so it can rise out of there, and then you can put it on the platter. And of course. 30 minutes, but watch your oven because it could overcook. Y'all, that's the foods of Ramsey Curtis. Thank you so much for stopping by as we continue to visit the bed and breakfasts of the Bayou State and cook up more great taste of Louisiana. I'm going to sip on cider. To learn more about A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Folson Company, visit PBS online at the internet address on your screen. Hot beignets and warm boudoirs by Chef John Folson is available for $29.95. This companion book to the series features over 150 recipes. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen. Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Fultz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarans Authentic New Orleans Style Dinner Mixes. Zatarans, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana. She's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.